Hi everybody. Today we're going to look at a Rotel model RX400A receiver. This is a nice little 25 watt per channel receiver. Uh, back in earlier days when these things were really even the low end units were built to pretty high quality standards. It has a nice veneered cabinet and it's one of those cabinets that you slide the receiver into so the, the wood goes all the way around. Pretty cool. Now the first thing I will say is I think this thing was in much better condition when it shipped than when it arrived. It was your typical thrown in the box with some bubble wrap which really annoys me when people do that. I understand that things have to be done to a cost when people are selling these especially when they're going for very low dollars sometimes. But I think a good option would be for people selling things on eBay to be able to offer two options. One, to, to have the <laughs> thrown in the box shipping and take your chances and the option to pay a little bit more to have it more carefully packaged because I certainly would have paid extra for better packaging. And I'm sure many people who purchase things like this on, on eBay would do the same. So you can see when it showed up, uh, this corner was bent out. And if you look at the, the images that were on, you know, when I purchased it, this wasn't like this. It cracked the corner down here and separated it a little bit. And most importantly, it broke the antenna. And this is something that you see quite often uh, whenever you purchase something online and have it shipped. The antenna is just connected by these cheap little plastic hinges and it's very easy for them to break off. And I found the broken piece uh, down in the bottom but of the box and uh, really there, I can't blame the shipping company for this. It really has to do with uh, how it was packaged. Anyway, enough about that. That's not what this video is about. has some nice speaker terminals there, screw down terminals. It even has a breakout for the preamp out and main amp in. And really, you don't see that very often on the smaller little 25 watt uh, receiver. So this is a very good receiver for what it is. It uh, has speaker fuses. This one is going to be a capacitor coupled output and a quasi complementary uh, uh, output section with, uh, you know, so it'll have that, that half of the power supply, you know, DC offset on it that's separated by a capacitor. So very similar to the uh, Scott receiver that we did not too long ago. And I think this is really going to clean up nicely. I'm hoping I can fix some of this here. We'll see when we get it apart. A uh, little bit dirty faceplate. The knobs are kind of, some of them are kind of stiff. Some of them, like this one's really kind of frozen up, the volume control. But we'll clean all that and we'll see how it works. So because this thing banged around in a box in, in shipping, uh, I'm probably going to take the cover off and inspect for any loose parts before I try to plug it in and turn it on. I, I would hate to have something laying down on the board somewhere and short out when I plug it in just because I, did, I failed to check that first. So kind of one of my habits. Okay, so we have the cover off and this side trim piece, as you can see over here, just basically fell off. It does have, it is bent. And we're just going to have to be careful straightening this out because we don't want it to break. This aluminum will, is brittle. It'll break. But other than that, it seems to have survived. I zip tied this up out of the way. And I think we can make a new set of these little brackets out of uh, metal strapping. We'll try that at the end of the video. You hear on other videos, especially with uh, the television restoration videos, you hear a term called tin whiskers. And this has a good example of it. And if we look down here, we can see what tin whiskers actually look like. So it has to do with the, the, the plating that they put on some of these metal covers. And if you look very closely, without going out of focus, you can see some of those tin whiskers growing on the outside there. And those can be cleaned off. The problem is those things are metal. They're conductive. 
sometimes they also call them uh, dendrils. Uh, and what can happen is if those form on the inside of the cover, as you can see they did a little bit here on the tuning capacitor, they can technically short out and they can actually cause a short between the cover, which is connected to ground of course, and the whatever item it is that, you know, the circuit that it's connecting to. So if you look right here, here's, here's an adjustment for your tuning capacitor, uh, tuning gang, and you can see right in there how close that is. And if those whiskers get down in there, it can actually short this little terminal to ground. So what we want to do is we're going to want to clean that all off really well. And we'll do that in this video. So looking at the schematic, I'm just kind of zoomed in on one of the channels of the power amplifier section. And you can see that there is your B plus voltage is coming in right here at this center point. And that's called B1 and it's 47 volts DC. You can just barely see that in the upper corner. And it goes through one of your fuses that's on the back of the amplifier. So it goes through this fuse and here are your your output pair and you notice they are both NPN. They are the same polarity of transistor. Now in a true complementary amplifier you would have a NPN and a PNP down here and you would have a negative voltage power supply on this side and you would have a positive voltage power supply over here and in the center these two transistors would reference to ground through your speaker. But if you look at this the way they're doing it is you're referencing this transistor to ground and this one has the positive voltage on it and this center point is going to be one half roughly of your B plus. So if you have 47 volts here you're going to have about 23 volts or so, 22 volts, there'll be a few volts loss in the components at this center point right here. And of course what will happen is when you apply your signal, your audio, the voltage will drive up and down from that center point. So it can drive up to the rail and it can drive down to the ground point, theoretically. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be exactly because you're going to have the losses of the components. And it'll, it will reference ground through that, uh, through your speaker. Now, because of that, you're going to have a constant, that DC offset that we call. And we certainly don't want 25 volts or 22 volts DC sitting on our speaker, do we? If we put DC on the speaker, that's going to pull the cone in and it's going to burn up your voice coil. So what they do is they put this decoupling capacitor. This capacitor will pass the audio signal through it just fine but it will block the DC level. And that's what this is for. So this is a very important capacitor. If this capacitor exhibits uh, a short or leakage, it will leak that DC voltage onto the speaker. So this has to be a very high quality capacitor. Conversely, if this capacitor has a high ESR or equivalent series resistance, it can actually affect the sound quality and the damping factor and all these other things. So this has to be a good quality capacitor. Now we got into this earlier in another video, the value of this capacitor and how it affects the frequency curve uh, of the amplifier. And that sometimes you really don't want to mess with this value. If it's a thousand microfarads, it, that's what it needs to be. And we also determined that changing this value uh, in some instances will not make a huge difference in the uh, the sound of the amplifier or the response curve. It, you know, a big change in the capacitance makes a small change in the response curve. And that all has to do with the math behind it and we looked at that earlier. So anyway, this is a single rail power supply so it's going to have a very simple uh, power supply. Let's see if we can find that in here the other half 
of the schematics. And if we look right, let's see, where is our power supply? Am I looking? Oh, idiot. So if we look right here, this is all there is to the power supply. You have your AC in with that jumper that we showed earlier. You have a 3 amp fuse. And so they it's not inside that jumper. I'm kind of surprised. Where is the fuse? No, I guess it is inside that jumper. They're just not showing it that way on here. But you have a you basically have a full wave rectified single rail power supply. So you have your two diodes on the outer parts of your transformer, center tap, reference to ground, comes out of there, and it goes through this 2200 microfarad 50 volt cap, which I was talking about here. And again, this is a very simple power supply. So simple power supply, simple problems, right? Easy to troubleshoot, easy to work on. And then you have just a resistive dropper for the other power supplies, the you know, that drops the voltage. And you have one right here that I'm assuming is going to be your regulated 12 volt supply. And all they're doing on that is they're just using a Zener diode and getting your 12 volts from right there. So of course today you would use you know a linear regulator like a 7812 or or something like that but this will get it this will be just fine. And you can see they use a, a combination of two resistors to get a, the, a specific resistance that they want. So there you go. Very simple stuff. Okay we have our meter out have a nice light on the subject and I have this set up to our little current limiting rig over there and I'm just going to turn this thing on and I think the first place we're going to check is going to be the output of your bridge rect or your uh, full wave rectifier and that's right there should be what goes to the that big capacitor that we were looking at and yeah you can see that down here there's a red wire and that leads over to the cap that's over here it kind of goes up and snakes its way up onto there so we should be able to just look right at this capacitor and we should be able to see our little bit less than 47 volts because I have the current limiting bulb in there right now if we turn it on and sure enough 43.9 44 volts so that's a good sign because we're only drawing 150 milliamps and we only, we're putting about 114 volts in there through that current limiting and we're getting the voltage we expect so that tells me there's no shorted components or anything if one of those resistor or uh, transistors were to short or something like that um, you would you know you'd see that excessive current and the voltage would drop way down so our power supply seems to be working now we can check a couple of these other ones let's see there's 20 volts there 30 volts there and those are our 31 volt supply and our 17 volt supply and again without being loaded down a whole lot or anything right now things are going to be okay moving to the front here we're going to look at our 12 volt regulator and it's right on 12 volts that's good okay let's look at our B plus and midpoint voltage for each channel. So if I go here, I have nothing. There it is. Okay. So there's your 45 volts there. 
this should be your midpoint voltage on because we're checking the collectors of these transistors one collector should be the full voltage the other one should be half of the voltage and you can see this one's only got 0.8 volts so i'm going to say this channel is dead this one there's your b plus and that one's good see you have about half the voltage down there i don't know if you could see that let me turn the light on maybe that make it easier to see so b plus half of the voltage and b plus no voltage so something's wrong with that right channel and it's not the fuse because we have our b plus up there so it has to be something wrong with a transistor i would say okay another little tip if you can't remember the pinout of a particular transistor package you can look it up of course but most service manuals especially these really good ones done in the 1970s and 80s they'll always put a little map in the bottom somewhere of your schematics of the pinouts of the different components so here's your transistors for the outputs and as you can see on your typical TO220 transistor the, the pinout is base collector emitter so that middle pin is the same as the tab there the middle pin and the tab are tied together on these ones now that's not in every TO220 transistors so for instance this one this is an old failed transistor you can see that that metal tab acts as your heat sink but it is also tied to that center pin and acts as the collector that's why I was able to put the probe of the meter right onto that tab and check the collector now we're interested in the base so that's going to be the first pin or pin one and these transistors are placed in here this way from our perspective how we're looking at it so we're going to look at this bottom pin on all of the transistors to see what they're supposed to be now if you remember the transistor that's connected to B plus should have a, about 20 some volts on the base so we're going to start by checking that bottom pin and you can see ours only has 1.4 volts now if we go down to the channel that is functioning and you can see 23.8 volts just like it says in the schematic so we know right away that this transistor does not have the correct voltage on it now what we're not sure of is is that because the transistor is partially shorted or is it because another transistor or a resistor or something is open circuit so now we have to kind of go back a little bit to see where we are now normally this process would go relatively fast if we weren't stopping and going back to the schematic and explaining things but I want to make sure you understand the you know the method of what we're doing so we checked here which is the same point as the emitter of this transistor and we're only getting about one would we see 1.8 volts or so less than two volts so now what we want to do is we want to go back here and you can see they're saying there's 24 volts there so we should see 24 volts on this driver transistor if we don't see 24 volts here we have something wrong in our bias circuit okay the base of our driver transistor and we were looking at that we were saying we want 24 volts so here's our meter the base is going to be this pin up here we looked it up again on our little chart and let's see what we have and look at that it's 1.98 so we have to go back further because that transistor is not correct either let's go back here no 24 volts here so let's check and see if we have our 47 volts getting through this 2.2 K resistor you should have your voltage dropped right there and then we should see our 24 volts here so if we're not getting 24 volts here we're pro we may be getting we may have a problem with something along here so we're gonna have to look at that so maybe there's something wrong with the resistor or something 
So here's our 2.2K and our 5.6K, and we're going to look on either side of those. So looking up here, we have our 2.2K resistor right there and our 5.6K right there. So the 2.2K is the first in line. So let's check one end of it. And you can see there's your 44 volts. And if we go to the other end of our 2.2K, 32 volts. So you can see we do have voltage there, and it is dropped, meaning that there must be some load at the end of that resistor, or it would still be 44 volts. So there's something there. Now, if I go over to the 5.6K, it should still be that 32 volts, and it is. I don't know if you can see that. Hold on, 32 volts. And here's the other end of the 5.6, and look at that, 1.98 volts. So something is shorted or something down here because you should not have 1.9 volts at the end of that 5.6K. So going back to our schematic, what can be causing that? So we have 30 some volts, so we're dropping 30 volts across this 5.6K resistor. Now we have these two diodes and these are your bias spreader diodes and I'm thinking those are right here. So you can see our two resistors right here and then you see these you know here and here and then if you there we go and if you look at this purple and blue wire they go over to here and you can see this little device here it's a little resistor or I mean it's a little diode looking thing and look at that measuring that if I back way out let me move the can move this where you can see it you can see at one side you have 1.98 volts and on the other side of that bias spreader you have 0.8 volts so you have about a one volt drop across there which is about what I would expect uh, looking at two diode drops so I think those diodes are okay so that brings us down to this area if I zoom in So now we're down to this area right here, because we have a one volt drop here, which is, what, again, what I would expect on two diode drops. Each diode is going to drop about a half a volt, plus or minus a couple, you know, tenths. And, of course, we don't have 23 volts here. We have one, about one, about 0.8 volts right here. So now we have to see if there's something wrong with this potentiometer or if we have a shorted transistor right here. Now this is a 5K resistor and that's, you know, even, even with that 5K there, I don't think you'd get one volt up here. So I don't think this transistor is shorted. If this was shorted, you would have a voltage divider of 5,022 ohms with the 5.6K minus the one volt. There's no way that you would have only one, only eight tenths of a volt right here. So either this pot is turned way down somehow or something and, and this is shorted, or this transistor here is bad, which is your bias adjustment transistor, or this potentiometer is dirty and not making contact and this transistor is just basically, because of the pot is wide open, it's turned on wide open and it's blocking all this out. So we're going to check that right now. All I'm going to do is I'm going to go to VR502 and I'm going to move it a little bit while I'm monitoring this point and I'm going to see if this, if this voltage comes up. If it does, we know we have a bad pot. If it does not, then I'm going to suspect this transistor and we're going to check that a little more carefully. Alright, so R502 is this pot right up here 
and we're just going to try moving it a little bit to see if it's just dirty or failing and we're clipped on to our bias diode stabister whatever you want to call it and you can see if I turn it it makes virtually no difference in the voltage so I don't think so unless it's a broken potentiometer I don't think there's that it is the problem so I think we're looking at a bad transistor all right right here it's TR 507 and you can see we should have about a 2 volt drop across here so there should be 24 volts here which it's not 22 volts here 23 volts here so this is going to be 23 volts and then you're going to have your 0.7 volt drop or whatever which is where you're seeing your 22 volts and then here you have your 24 volts up here let's just see where they're sitting okay so this is the transistor in question and if I look it would help if I plug the probe into the meter huh okay <laughs> There's 0.8 there, 2 volts there, and 0.1 volts there. So we do have different voltages all the way around, but that doesn't mean anything yet. So looking at the voltages around here, I think we need to pull TR508 and check it out of circuit and see what it looks like. I think that's where we're having a problem here. Okay, these types of boards are much more delicate than the green, you know, type circuit boards you see. And whenever you're heating these up to remove them, you have to be very quick. You either have to use a really good solder pump or you have to set the temperature low enough on the solder desoldering gun uh, that you can get in there quickly to melt the solder but yet not overheat the trace because these traces will lift right up off the board you have to be very careful and these are not ones that I like to use uh, desolder wick on which is you know this braiding copper braiding stuff it you end up having too much dwell time if you're not careful and it's easy to lift the traces up so just be careful so this one's all desoldered and let's pull this transistor out and see if it's bad so with this one the tab is facing down this way just want to give myself some reference and let's get the tester out and check it okay let's put this in here see if it tests out good two diodes I would say that is a bad transistor and let's just for giggles and grins let's see what what our meter says we'll check it the old-fashioned way and remember it's P this is an NPN so the base is going to be the center pin on here, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, let's make sure I don't get this wrong. Yeah, base is in the middle. So, if I go from this end to here, I should see a voltage drop. And I do. If I go from this end to here, and I see a voltage drop, and I do. And if I go from this end to this end, look at that, emitter to collector short. So it's a shorted transistor. Now, this is, I don't know why they use this little metal case transistor, but I have a feeling this is just going to convert over to your standard ECG-123. Um, but I'll look it up and find out. We'll see what we have. 
Okay, looking this up, a 2SC538A is an NPN silicon transistor. Looks like Matsushita is the, is the manu original manufacturer. And looking at a few of these things, uh, they're not really, yeah, the 238 and the 238A and the 230, yeah, 238 and 238A are pretty much the same other than the package. One of them's in a metal case and one of them's in a plastic case. And you can see they're relatively low HFE. Well, no, they don't even list it on these. Look at that. 10 volts, 0.3 watts, so 300 milliwatt. Maximum collector current is 50 milliamps, 45 volts, V collector to base. So you can see this is a pretty standard transistor and I would say uh, ECG 123 if we want to stick with the metal case and keep the look that should work just fine. So let me see if I can dig one of those out. I still have those somewhere. I used to have a whole bunch of them. Let me see if I can find one. Okay. And you can see this is uh, what I found was I have an old RCA, new old stock, which translates to an ECG123A. These are really good transistors, by the way. If you can get your hands on these SK series, these have always performed really well over the years for me. And you can see similar characteristics. Uh, actually, it's a little better. This one's 1 1.8 watts instead of 300 milliwatts. So just a little heavier duty transistor, but now the HFE being 200, I'm not sure if that's what the original transistor was, but we'll try it and see. If it doesn't work, we'll take it out and we'll look at something different. Un unfortunately, well, let me see if I have another data sheet for this. Okay, let's see. We have this Howard Sam's transistor substitution book. And if we look up the 2SC538A, SK3124. Well, this is a 3444, so that might not be good. Um, what else? ECG123A, which is the same thing. GE61. BC107B. I don't have one of those. So let's see. It's saying the ECG123A, and this translates to a 123A also. I don't know the difference between a 3444 and a 3124, but I have a feeling the main difference is going to be voltage and not gain. So, where was I? Yeah, here. So let's try this. I think it's going to work. And just for giggles and grins, I went on the NTE Quick Cross and the same thing, 2SC538A is translating to uh, NTE199 or a 123AP. These are the different version. And right there is the straight 2SC538A, which is what we have, 123AP. P means plastic case. Uh, just the 123A is the metal case. So. Again, the metal case just handles a little bit more, and I think that might be the difference between the 3144 and the 3444. So this is basically the same as the 3144, except metal case instead of plastic. So I think we'll be okay. Or maybe it's not a, yeah, it's metal case. So that's what we'll use. New and shiny. Okay, let's test this one out. Brand new out of the box out of the package. That's more like it. And HFE of 122. And I think we're going to be okay. Okay, our shiny new transistor is installed over here. Let's uh, think if we just touch the collector of that transistor, we should be able to see uh, our, where are we going to have 20 some volts there maybe? All right, let's just go onto the case for now. 
yep there it is 24 volts and if we go to here yes sir look at that 24.6 now our amps back up and running again so that was the problem we had a bad transistor all right let's turn the amplifier on and this is something I have just gotten into the habit of doing out of an abundance of caution we want to make sure these capacitors are not shorted because if they're shorted and I connect speakers up to this guess what's going to happen we're going to put 40 volts or 20 some volts right onto the voice coil of the speaker of DC so amplifier on and if you look there very little voltage almost nothing how about here same thing okay I'm not worried about that again that's open circuit because there's nothing on there right now uh, when we get a low impedance speaker load on there that'll drop even further so all right we're safe to connect our speakers now if you remember when we turn this on these uh, this is a capacitor coupled amplifier so as that capacitor charges through the speaker voice coil or comes to equilibrium we should say uh, you'll hear that little pop and then everything then it'll that's just normal because that's the capacitor uh, that's in there so let's turn it on there is a little thump and I'm going to put bass in trouble center range I'm going to go over to the auxiliary and boy that's scratchy inputs and I'm going to play a YouTube library song called caramel shades I don't even know what caramel shades sounds like but we'll play it and see if we get some sound here we go nope all right stereo Out, out, out. Speaker one on, speaker two. Okay, let's try it. Well, that sounds pretty awful. Left channel, right channel. Well, I would like to think that was just the music because it's a distortion guitar, but I don't think so. Let's <laughs> let's try another song that we've heard before. Let's do the uh, where's that one that I like? Hold on one second. Okay, we're going to do this song called Mirage. I've done this one many times. I know exactly what it sounds like, and therefore we know what we should hear. Wow, that's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Okay, so we definitely have more problems. Uh, yeah, we definitely have more problems than just uh, that one bad transistor. We are getting sound out of both channels, but is equally horrible on both sides. So we're going to have to determine, do we have a problem with the controls, like we just have noisy controls causing that distortion, or do we actually have uh, a bad power supply or bad capacitors, and mul uh, multiple bad transistors? Who knows? We're going to go through and troubleshoot it. First things first, let's get some contact cleaner into the controls here, into the volume control. And this is this quick dry stuff, so I kind of like it because uh, it doesn't leave any residue and it evaporates and it just won't leave slime all over the inside of your receiver like that like the deoxid stuff and those things that leave leave uh, oil behind. I'll put some of that on later. 
some fader lube or something, but with what that stuff costs, I don't see a need to put that on yet until we at least get this thing working properly, right? All right, that feels a little bit better. Hopefully that cleaned it up. Okay. And we might as well do all of them while we're in here. So let me go through and clean them all and uh, we'll be right back. Okay, let's, uh, controls are cleaned. Let's see if we made any difference. Turn up the volume. Okay, I still hear distortion. Let's turn the balance. That's our left channel. Right channel. Very clear. So it looks as if cleaning the controls fixed the one noisy channel, but the left channel still has a problem. Now, maybe this is going to come back and bite me because Remember I said earlier, I'm not going to worry about the, the uh, idle current or bias or anything. Maybe that's what's causing our problem. So let's take a look at that and see if maybe that's our problem. All right, we're connected up here. And as you can see, we have absolutely no idle current. And at that test point, which we're reading across R531, which is right here, you can see that we're just reading across this resistor. They're saying that we want an idle current of 7.5 millivolts. I have zero millivolts, and that's probably because I was fiddling around with that pot. So let's see if we can turn it. Uh oh, we're getting nothing on the pot. So either we have a bad potentiometer or we have another bad transistor. So we're going to have to look into this. Why is it doing this? Okay, removing this pot from the circuit, and I did find a replacement. I don't think it's bad. Actually, it looks to be in very good condition. And if I connect it and move it, you can see it's very smooth. I mean, I'm not having any problems at all with this. I'll just lock it in on that range. And if I move to the other side, just to make sure. And again, moves very smoothly. So this pot's not the problem. That leaves us with one conclusion here, and this transistor may also be bad. Which would make sense because if one of these fails, perhaps something here was bad as well. So let's take this out. Wow, look how this thing was put in there. I did not bend those leads. That's how they were in the board. <laughs> Unbelievable. So this is a 2SA684. It's a PNP transistor. Let's put it on the tester. It looks to me like it's okay. PNP transistor, I think it's fine. So I think it can go back in. Okay, so here is where we are so far. I probably should have lined this up before I turn the camera on. So just give me a moment. All right, we know from our tests. And let me get a pointing device. We know from testing this that the potentiometer was not bad. It's good. We took it out and tested it. This transistor was bad. It, it, had, it was shorted, so we replaced this one. That still did, that got our 20 volts back, but it did not allow, we still could not adjust the bias. And if you recall, the sound was very distorted. So. If we can't adjust the bias, then the first thing we would look at would be our bias spreader transistor. But if you measure across here, I mean, it seems to be working, but it's still not, we're still not getting any bias current uh, down here. 
So I check these transistors just statically. They don't seem to be bad. When I got to the outputs, this one down here, I think we may have found something. Let me show you. Okay, those of you who are regular, regular viewers of this channel uh, have seen me show you how to test a transistor using a uh, multimeter. So we have the meter set to diode mode. And remember, these are NPN transistors. So if that is the case, we want to put the P lead, the red one, on the base. And the base just happens to be the bottom pin on this one. Now when we place the black lead on the emitter or the collector, they should both read like a diode. So you should see that diode drop of anywhere from 0.5 to 0.7 volts. So if we go from the base to the collector, the collector is the, me the middle pin, there we go, we have it. But if we go to the base to the emitter, wide open. And that's pretty strange for these output transistors. Normally the way an, an output transistor fails is they short. You don't get this. And by the way, if you look, I desoldered these from the circuit board, so they're just kind of floating in the middle of the, of the, of the hole, but they're not touching. Uh, if you leave them connected, it, they definitely you could have other circuitry interfere with your tests. But I didn't want to completely remove them if I didn't have to. Now this top one, same thing. If we go from the base to the collector, we have our diode drop, and base to emitter, we have our diode drop. So that transistor is good. So we actually have an open output transistor. Not a shorted one, but an open one. How about that? So we have an open transistor and we had a shorted uh, pre-driver transistor there. So bad and bad. These seem to be okay, but what I will do out of good measure is I will replace them uh, with a, these will get a, for the, PN, for the NPN we're going to put a or the PNP, I'll put a 2SA916. And for the NPN, I'll put a KSA, or I'm sorry, a KSC2383, I think is what this is. And they probably can get away without replacing them, but, well, when you see that many things go bad, it kind of makes you wonder when, when the next ones are going to fail. So these are... Or since I have them and they're very, very inexpensive, we're going to replace them. I have to find some suitable replacements for these outputs, though. We're going to have to look them up. Now, looking at these, we have two SC1107s for the outputs. You can see that right there, two SC1107. I went through all of my substitution manuals and data sheet manuals and my notebook full of transistor notes and nowhere can I find a 2SC1107. Now using the, I've used the NTE Quick Cross and it does not translate to, it does translate to a transistor but it is absolutely the wrong one and if I use the manual here, let's see here, 2SC, I'll look it up in the book here. You guys can feel free to skip through this part. So 2SC 1107, sometimes the, the hard copy paper book has more information than the, than the software. 2SC 1107, there it is. And in here, I'll show you. A 2SC1107, see if I can get it to focus, 2SC1107, do you see it right there? 2SC1107 is a ECG186A, and you're going to find out a 186A is not, not even the same package. 
So let me look that up here. Hold on. And if we look at the 187A, or 186A, I'm sorry, it is an NPN silicon. And if you look, it's in, it's in a TO202 package, which is a different package. And it's only rated, where does it say, uh, dissipation, 12.5 watts. And there's a little note that says, 25 degrees Celsius. So this is not a 12 watt transistor. These are TO220 package and this is a 25 watt per channel amplifier. They're not going to use a 12 watt uh, transistor in there. And yes, you can do the math and everything and this is only half of the waveform. And Nobody's going to drive a transistor at that level. So we're going to have to kind of figure it out what we have here. And I have some ideas, and I'll show you here what I come up with. Okay, what I'm going to try is an MJE3055T. And this is a 90 watt transistor. It has a VCE and, v and uh, VBE breakdown of uh, 100 volts. So it's right in there, perfect for this. 90 watt dissipation, Fairchild semiconductor, very good quality. And these aren't super high frequency, but this isn't that type of amplifier. And these are really durable. And you can see they have a nice gain to them, HF EVA 113. So these are going to be, I think they're going to work pretty well for this. So we're going to replace those, and of course, if this all works, I will replace the transistors on the other channel just so they are all the same. I want the, I want both channels to perform identically, even though you probably won't see much difference. If I'm going to replace these transistors with different ones than was originally with it, I want both channels to match. But we're going to try this first on the one channel. Okay, and with the transistor out, you can see it tests as two diodes. And take a look, even though the schematic says that it's a 2SC1107, right here, this looks like it is a 2SD, what is that, a 317? Yes, 2SD317. We can look that up and see if our transistor that we chose will match up with that. And another thing I noticed while I was in here, this channel uses the 2SD317s, the other channel, if you take a look, uses 2SC1061s, which is a completely different one. And you can see they're both 1061s. So either somebody replaced these at some point, although the soldering looked like it was untouched. It doesn't look like anybody ever worked on this board. These look original. And actually, you can see where I broke the the paint the enamel on the screws when I took it apart so I think maybe when these were made at the factory they had these different transistors like this kind of strange isn't it but uh, we're gonna put all the same kind in there but we're gonna look these up and see if any of these cross over into something we can recognize so you can see this is gonna be another one of those oddball ones 2SD 317 and my book goes up and skips from 14 to 18 <laughs> And then let's look at our other book, 2SD317. Right, 2SD317. Yeah, that's in. Okay, I have it in this book. So it will convert to a 2SD318, which we had that on that other one, or an ECG152. We're in HEP 245. So let's look up what the ECG 152 is. Since we have our book out, let's look at the 152. Isn't this fun, guys? Hey, this is what you got to do when you're working on these. You know, a lot of these components aren't around anymore. Okay, a 152, that's more like it. So that is a 40 watt transistor, which sounds more reasonable and these have a uh, 
a VCBO and a VCE of 90 volts. I'm looking right here. And these are not high frequency, they're 8 megahertz, although the, the MJEs are probably a little bit lower frequency than that. Maybe not. So we can definitely use the MJEs. Those should work fine. Uh, let's see what the 2SC1061 is. Okay, the 2SC1061 does have some data. It is an NPN. It has 50 volts for its voltage, so you're pushing that one, that, that 47, 48 volt supply. Although there's not that full voltage on it all the time. 25 watt instead of 40 watt. And we don't know what the, uh, we don't know what the transition frequency is, but I think we're going to stick with these MJEs. I think they're going to work well for us. Now, before we go any further though, I do want to mention one thing. You noticed I looked those transistors up in the NTE manual and when you looked up these 2SC 1107s in the NTE manual, it gave you the absolute wrong <laughs> crossover. So don't always trust the NTE manuals. A lot of times NTE will use the same transistor to substitute a whole bunch and in many cases it will work but in other cases it will not and I know a lot of people get down on NTE parts that they're junk they're not junk it's just that they are not always the, the exact transistor that you are replacing and that's where you get into trouble with it if the transistor suits the application there's nothing wrong with using an NTE transistor. I've used them for many, many, many years. Uh, when Newtone came out, I remember. I mean, originally it was ECG, which was Sylvania, which was Electrician's Component Group. And then you had the SK, which was the RCA series. And the Newtone came out, and they kind of are still one of the only ones left. And there was even a TCG, Technician Components Group, that was out for a short while in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s. But they didn't stay around too long, I don't think. I don't see them anymore. But anyway, enough history. Let's get these in. Okay, the new transistors are in, and look at that. We have bias. Pretty awesome. Now... I know I'm going to get a comment about this, and I did this on purpose. If you notice, I put these on with sill pads. What is a sill pad? Some of you might ask. Some of you already know. These are flexible silicon pads. Uh, there are many different versions of these, okay? There's really cheap ones, and then there's very expensive good ones, and many in between. And they take the place of these little mica insulators uh, that they used to use and that you still see they're still used and normally what you would do you see the ones down here it's very hard to see them but there's that little piece of mica in between the transistor and the metal heat sink and what that does is it will transfer the heat from the transistor to the heat sink but it will insulate the electricity so it's an electrical insulator and a thermal conductor. And the whole idea of that is you don't want the collector, as I said earlier in the video, the tab of these transistors is, is con connected to the collector. And you certainly don't want the collector shorting to the metal heat sink that is at ground potential. So you, that's what those are there for. Now, later on, they came out with these and originally the way you did it was you used this little piece of mica and you put some thermal grease on the mica and that would help uh, conduct the heat better, more efficiently. Then they came out with these sill pads that don't require grease and are very easy to put in, but some of them, uh, the cheaper ones, they can tear easily if you're not careful 
and some of them do not have as good of a thermal conductivity as the mica pads do. Now, before you make a comment on my sill pads, understand that do your research before you put your comment on my channel about this. I get a lot of comments that I can tell people just saw, read something on a forum and they're repeating it and the information they're giving trying to correct me or correct everybody is wrong because they didn't do their research first. These sill pads won't tear. <laughs> they're pretty tough. You can tear them of course if you over tighten it too bad but you can also crack these mica pads too just the same and they actually have a better thermal conductivity factor than the mica and grease even when the mica and grease is properly installed. So I showed this on uh, a chart actually of some of the different types uh, on one of my previous videos. Those of you who are regular viewers have probably seen it already. But uh, sill pads are not evil. <laughs> and don't be afraid to use them under the correct conditions. There are times where you're better off with the mica and the uh, grease depending on the area where you're installing them. But in this case, these would work just fine and they're a lot less mess and they're easy to install and they have a very good thermal conductivity. Again, make sure you buy good ones. If you just buy generic ones you know, on eBay or something, you don't know what you're getting. But if you order them from a reputable dealer like Mauser, DigiKey, whatever, you can actually download the spec sheet for them. And that makes a big difference. And you can see we're getting a little bit of bias creep right now. We started out, we were about 5.7 to 6, and the, getting a little bit of bias creep, so we're going to let this warm up. Part of that is because these stabisters are just sitting up here on these heat sinks or up on these terminal strips, but they're not really thermally coupled to the heat sink. You normally would put those on the heat sink physically so that they can help, uh, so they'll thermally track better. Um, this isn't is kind of, the, the, we just don't have that kind of design here, but that would help if we did that. Anyway, this will work just fine though. This design doesn't really need that, and it's worked all these years this way, so. <laughs> It'll work a lot more years uh, from now. Okay, so we're pretty reasonable here. And basically to adjust these, there are two controls. There's the bias and then there's the DC or the uh, balance. They're calling it on this one. Sometimes you would call it offset. Essentially, we set this for an idle current and I showed you that on the meter we want it to be for this particular one you want it to be about 7.5 millivolts at the test point across this resistor down here and then once you get that sitting at at the 7.5 millivolts or a little bit less it can be 6 millivolts it'll be fine then you're gonna take and turn put a sine wave into the auxiliary input connect this to a dummy load and read, you know, look at, look at your scope across the dummy load. And what you should see is you should see symmetrical clipping when you drive it into clipping. So we're going to do that right now, I'll show you what it does. Now, this is what adjusts for the symmetrical clipping. So let me see if I can get this all in shot. And I know there's a lot of reflections. You'll just have to bear with me on that. Because really, no matter what, we're just going to get the... <laughs> going to get that. So let's turn the volume up and look at that. Both channels are right over top of one another right now. And you can see right there it starts to clip. And you're seeing a little bit of power supply bounce right there. All right. And it's it's right on right now. Now if it were not on, I'll move this so that you can see what it does. You see how the bottom is coming up as I adjust it? Let's see here. See that? And the idea is you want the clipping to be equal on both sides. Right there, like that. Then when we turn it down, we're all set. And you can see we are getting 
that clipping we're getting somewhere in the line of what's it saying get about 25 watts very close to it each each one of these now well, we're not quite getting 25 watts right there would be 20 watts and right here is 10 watts so we're not getting that full 25 watts that they were claiming but of course there could there could be some still some issues in here and part of it could be the filter capacitor part of it could be the output caps but I don't know I think these we will have to check them for ESR and everything uh, but let's see if we run this up to right there that's saying how many watts we're at 10 per see these lines down here show the wattage roughly and each graticule is 10 watts so for instance right there's about 15 watts per channel and there's no clipping there but we get up above that 15 watt range and you can see it clips pretty hard there's 20 watts <laughs> that's about all we can get so okay Okay, just looking at this for the specs, it's saying 25 watts per channel minimum RMS, both channels driven at 8 ohms per channel, both channels, okay, from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with no more than 0.5% THD. And if you go down here, it's saying THD uh, continuous rated power no more than 0.1 percent at 13 watts so really they're saying 13 watts and we're at 12.5 and again we would have to uh, connect the distortion meter to see where it gets crazy but right there's about 15 watts per channel and you can see it's just starting to clip a little bit and for 12.5 right there, I mean, that's very clean, just like they're saying. But 25, it's clip, or 20 watts right there is clipping very hard. So we have a, just a 2200 microfarad storage capacitor here, or filter cap for our main supply. And that is kind of a little bit low, probably. We did a video on this when we talked about it a couple of times. The most recent one was on the Scott uh, 342 receiver, and we talked about it a little bit. And we actually did the math showing you how much you really have to change the capacitance to get a big change. But in this instance, you kind of have a small transformer here. As you can see my hand, there's the transformer, not very big. And in addition to that, 2200 microfarad we probably could put a 4700 it might buy us a little bit uh, of extra clean power at, when it you know before it clips because when you see that bounciness okay that bounciness that you see there is not actual clipping that's your power supply kind of railing out there a an actual clip almost looks square it doesn't move it just kind of crops the top off so that tells me that we're railing out our power supply and the filter capacitor is no longer keeping up with the transformer so we may try increasing that a little bit in addition we can uh, check these output capacitors they may uh, they may have some wear in them. If they have high ESR, that will also cause a lot of problems with that. So we will check those couple of things. And again, I'm checking this right now at 400 hertz. I, if I put one kilohertz, it might go a little bit higher, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that. Okay, this is kind of interesting. 
Let's see where we clip with one kilohertz. Look how bad it's clipping right there at, at that 15 watts. So it seems like the higher we go in frequency, let's, let's go up uh, to 5 kilohertz. And turn it on. And take a look at that. You know, as we, it really starts. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe we can try those capacitors. Let's check those out. I did check all of these gray ones, and they're perfect. I mean, when I say perfect, they actually, some of them test better than the new ones that I have to replace them with. So, I'm not going to change those gray ones. But these guys might get replaced and this guy might get upgraded. Okay, while we replace the bias transistor on the other channel and these two drivers, and I'm just doing this uh, so that they're all the same, number one, and as kind of a preventative maintenance thing. I mean, these are the ones that have all the strain on them. The bias spreader and these two drivers are the ones that are gonna kinda have the stress on them. So we're gonna replace them. So I have this, another thing I noticed is on this schematic, and we'll do a little solder and talk while we do this. I saw that, I noticed that the, where were, where were we? The bias transistor right here is a 2SC1384, and those are a pretty robust transistor. But the ones that were in this particular unit were the 2SC828s, these little ones that are, used in the preamp. It seems like rather than using a special transistor they just to cut costs in a later production they just went with this same kind that's in the you know in the preamp section. Uh, but they're not really as robust as those 2SC uh, what I say 1383's or 1384's. So I am going to put the original type that belongs in there and I'm going to use a 2SC2383, which is about the same thing. And you can see how they're taller. They're rated at higher wattage. These are like a 1 watt device, and these other ones are, I think, 500 milliwatts or something like that. But they just can handle the current a little better. You know, they should last a little bit longer. I don't want this thing doing what it has already done <laughs> again so we're gonna just do a little bit of this just like I said preventative maintenance is it necessary no if this was going doing just a repair for a customer would you do this no uh, I would have just replaced those two transistors that we did and call it a day but we have the luxury of we have the parts in stock they're very inexpensive and we have all the time in the world because this is just a hobby. So, you know, why not, right? Okay. I think these capacitors are in fantastic shape. I don't think they need to be replaced. And you can see 1,000 microfarads is 1,100. And our ESR is not readable on this it's very low if we look at our dissipation factor it's 0 0.052 and look at the other one same thing I mean they're even matched uh, here's a brand new Nichicon KT series 2200 microfarad you can see the dissipation factor is a little higher ESR not readable and it's right on 2200 and again capacitor things I've done videos on this what all this stuff means Okay, so 
I think if we do uh, go up a little bit on the capacitance, it's not going to make a huge difference, but it may buy us a little tiny bit on this one. So we're going to try it and see. I don't really think we're going to see an appreciable difference because as we did the math in that last video, you could see that uh, you have to go way up in capacitance to get a little bit of a bump uh, in frequency, you know, or in uh, performance, you know, with where the roll off of the frequency is. But by going from the 1000 to the 2200, it does make a difference a little bit. So we're going to put that in. Every little bit is going to help on this. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to replace this capacitor, the main filter, and I'm going to go up in that a little bit because I do think the 2200 is a little bit low for uh, an amplifier that's supposed to be you know, 50 watts total, 25 watts per channel. So let me see what I can find that will fit in there. Okay, I dug around and I found I had one of these laying around. It's identical case size. Except instead of 2200 microfarads, this one is 10,000, <laughs> which is overkill. Really, a 4700, I think, would be good for this application. Now, again, the 10,000 is not going to hurt anything. Uh, and it, you do not need a soft start circuit because there's just not this, this single capacitor really isn't going to be that bad on the power switch with all these, everything that's in line with it. So you're going to be fine. So we're going to replace this and uh, let's see what kind of improvements we made. All right, the capacitors are all in and you can see I have it powered up and I have with 125 volts mains going in, we have about 49.4 volts on the B plus going into the transistors. And remember, these can handle this no problem. I have the distortion meter connected, as you can see up here. I have the scope. I have pretty much everything. We can monitor everything here now, huh? And if I crank the volume, it does a little bit better than it did. And you can see right there, we're getting power supply fat, uh, sag. We're dropping almost 9 volts. So that is the transformer right there dumping out on us. I'm looking, I'm monitoring the line on the uh, electronic circuit breaker. It's not dropping at all, so we're not having any line loss at all there. We're right at about 1% distortion, and we're getting just under 20 watts, just about 19 watts per channel right now. And that's about all this thing can do. And I think it's capable of the 25 watts they claim in the book, but not with this transformer the way it is. This transformer has a lot of sag, and it's because of the physical size. You can see it's kind of a small transformer, and that's where the magic is. You can do anything you want with capacitors or anything else. It's not going to change much. And what, what this is going to help us with is the dynamic power. If you have a very fast base passage, it's not going to draw down too much on the supply for a long period of time. This will handle it. But as soon as you try to drive continuous power, the transformer becomes the bottleneck here. And really, you're not going to, unless this stays at that 47 to 49 volts, you're never going to get that full power out because of the line sag. And that's what you're seeing. So this thing performs really well, I mean, as far as, as long as you understand its limitations. Uh, at 15 to 20 watts per channel, you know, 15 to 18 watts, let's say, there's, there's about 16 watts right there. And look at our distortion. Excellent. 0.05%. And if I take it up to about 0.1%, right around there. You're getting between 17 and 18 watts per channel. So not bad. And you're still getting the line sag, but that's to be expected with this. 
And that's the difference, you know. For instance, back to that Sansui 9090 that I worked on. The power, uh, the, the main capacitors on that, those big filters, they were only 12,000 microfarad each for 125 watt per channel amp. But when you looked at the transformer, it was absolutely massive. And that's really why you really didn't need the large capacitors. And again, capacitors don't solve your problem, once again, <laughs> uh, unless you're talking about really instantaneous dynamic power. Anyway, this whole thing's working. I'm going to wrap this video up right here. This is part one. And part two, we'll go through and do the receiver part, the, you know, the tuner, and we'll clean up the lights and things like that. But I think we have a performer here. It's working good now. And we'll uh, do some more things in the next part. Until then, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. We'll see you again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.